Hello and welcome to James's Wrestling Shoots Interviews where I profile the great and good of professional wrestling and my guest this week, straight from the five boroughs, you know him as the Brooklyn Brawler and so do I. Here he is, Steve Lombardi. How are you doing? I'm doing fantastic. It's a pleasure to be on your uh, on your YouTube channel, James. Oh, they all say that. They all no, say oh, that. Oh, no. I, I don't have to kiss ass, trust me. <laughs> I don't have to kiss ass. And it's only one borough I'm from is Brooklyn. There's five boroughs. You said I'm from all five boroughs. One borough. From a, Brooklyn, <laughs> the Brooklyn, Queens, Staten Island, you know how you know how it is. Yeah, but, I, I've even got my uh, I've even got my New York hoodie, my only New York hoodie I from did. when I went over. Fire department in New York. Yeah, it doesn't fit me anymore. I'm, I'm two sizes fatter than when I last went, though. So, <laughs> believe it or not, I'm thirty pounds lighter than I was in WWE. Yeah, how come? It's because I kept in shape. I got more vascular. I work out every day, and I uh, I take a lot of signings. I got at least four or five signings. Every every month one every month one, and uh, my first, my next one is in uh, what the heck am I going? Oh, right here. I, I'm in Michigan right now. All right. I'm in Michigan, and I got a I got a shot that's in Michigan. I got a shot that's in Pennsylvania. I got a shot that's in Texas. I got a shot. I'm going all over the place. Hmm. So it was nice. To, it's nice to be wanted. Well, I I'm not one to sit on the couch and do nothing. You know. I did, I did so many podcasts. I did JR's podcast. I've done uh, Bischoff's podcast. Jericho flew all the way to my house. <laughs> I did Jericho's podcast. You want to talk about viewership? He did about a million downloads in one week. Just on my... Yeah, I, uh, this, is, this is the only numbers I can dream of, I tell you. The, the money that I'd rake in as well. <laughs> That's yeah. so far away from, from where I'm at. You, you got to get sponsorships. Yeah, I, I do. I do, I do. But... Uh, I, Sponsorships hopefully are going to be in the future for me. But um, the first thing I'm going to ask you is, uh, it's actually going to be a career profile from the beginning because I had a look on a couple of resources. And the first match, it says, was in WWF in 1983. Now, I'm assuming you had a few matches beforehand at least, but where did you train and how did you get picked up so quickly in your career? Okay, actually, my first match was in Oregon. My first WWE match was in New York. What happened was I had no interest whatsoever. I used to look at old bodybuilding magazines and me and my brothers would always work out. So we'd be into bodybuilding magazines. We happened to look at wrestling magazines, Bruno San Martino, the big monster chest and uh, Billy Graham with the big arms. I don't know if you know these names. Yeah, I know them all. I had Bruno San Martino's last match of his whole career. And uh, I never dreamed that all the people that we've seen in those magazines when I was 15 and 16 years old, I'd be in the ring later in their career. I just, somebody, this is how it happened. Somebody gave me tickets to Madison Square Garden. I never been to a wrestling ma match in my life. The guy next to me, I went with a couple of friends. The guy next to me goes, I can tell this is your first experience. I said, yes. He goes, if you want to meet these guys, they go to this bar about four blocks from here called the Savoy. He goes, they all go there for beers and a couple of drinks afterwards. If you want to meet him, approach him. I did that. He says, wait about 45 to 50 minutes because they, the crowd and they got to get showered up and boom, I met them. I met Mr. Fuji. I met, uh, I met Arnold Skolan, which was a, gr a great, great to me. A couple of the guys would give me the business like Fuji. We are talking. Get away. We are talking, kid. You know, I, but I was persistent. I was persistent. So Skolan says, you want to be a wrestling kid? Go learn. Go, go, go to take some classes of self-defense. I took judo for about six months. <laughs> They put me up against a seventh degree black belt. I was 240. I was mostly muscle. I'd say 90% muscle. I took the seventh degree black belt. I laid over him and I put my forearm into his throat. He could not move. My judo teacher got mad at me. He said to me, you did not follow any procedures that we did. I showed him a picture of a wrestling magazine with a guy in a, an abdominal stretch. Do you know that move? Oh, yeah. He goes, I recommend you go back to your friends in WWF because we don't teach that here. <laughs> So I went back. I told him, hey, I took judo. I took this. And then school. And he goes, hey, kid, why don't you show up in Shirley, Long Island? You know, and I, which was like an hour from, you know, Brooklyn where I was. And he uh, threw me in a ring with, uh, for, well, first of all, I had my first match ever in my life against Kurt Henning, Mr. Perfect. He wasn't Mr. Perfect yet. I met him hanging around WWE. After I wrestled SD Jones, I started hanging around TVs. And then Kurt Henning came in. And I mean, he looked like, well, little, you're too young for this. Richie Cunningham and the Happy Days. No, of course, yeah, of course I've seen Richie yeah. Cunningham and I mean, the Happy Days. I mean, curly, red hair. He wasn't the Mr. Perfect that you knew when, you know, when you seen him. Yeah. Vince sent him away to Oregon. So he went to Oregon. Kurt told me, fly to Oregon, come to my house, and I'll help you out. 
So I flew to Oregon. I went to Kurt's house. He said, come to the matches tonight. And at that time, Dynamite my kid was working there. I'll play Boy Buddy Rose. He says to me, I'm going to challenge anyone out of the audience. He says, you stand up. I will, I will let you into the dressing room. I'll tell, I won't. He didn't tell the guys. He just kept it between me and him. So as soon as I stood up and I started walking to the dressing room, all the guys stood in front of the door and blocked me. And then, I, and then Kurt said something, Carney. Did you ever hear the term Carney? Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Yeah. It's me as art. He's smart. You know, it, it's a wizard. They, they moved inside. He goes, well, well, we'll see if they got some boots and tights that fit them downstairs. Well, actually, they were mine. Pre, <laughs> pre. So then I come out. He rehearsed it to me in his house. He says, grab a headlock and hang on. And that's all you need to do. And if you remember Kurt Henning, when you when you got a headlock, he's flopping and flipping and and turning. He 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 went outside the ring, the uh, outside the ring. He grabbed the barricade. I still got his head and my my half my body's in. He pulls the barricade towards the ring. I mean, it was hard to hang on to that guy. It really was. And he gave me a belly to back suplex, and then he groaned me about it my whole career. All you all you knew was headlock, and I I beat you with a belly to back. He's he's you know he was a big, big river. He was a big river. And I, when I, when I mean river, I know I'm going off your script here, but I mean river. One time I was wrestling in, in a local, about an hour from my house. I stopped like at a McDonald's or something. And Kurt was in the tower, of course. And uh, I, I feel something in my pocket. I had like a, a button down shirt. It was a dead white mouse. Now I got a hamburger in one hand. I got a dead mouse by a tail in another. I threw it out the window. I could not even think about eating this hamburger. I threw the hamburger out. I pulled the car over. I opened my bag. My bag's got mice in it all over the place. Oh. Yeah. What, what do you get? Bob by him and kill him? But that, that was his rib. And the way you know, you could tell who plays a rib in the dressing room is you walk in, whoever's looking away the hardest. <laughs> always be Kurt. That would always be Kurt. And then there was another rib that, that I, well, I'm, I'm telling you all these things now. Oh, no, please. I, I, one of the questions I've got is the ribs. And also, and I always cheat plug myself, I've written a couple of books. And one of them is uh, Owen Hart, King of Pranks. Owen where, was the king of kings of pranks. He was. My last words to Owen were, what are you doing, Owen? He was walking with the, you know, with the harness yeah. to go up to. He says, I'm moonlighting. That was his word were his last words to me. <laughs> but this is a class, but a big rib of Marty Jannetty. Did you ever hear about that one? Uh, many ribs by him. They were always the padlocks and uh, toothpicks in the car doors and stuff. Oh, yeah. Matt, Marty Jannetty, Jake the Snake was in the town, and they used to keep hundreds of rats to feed to the snake as we were on the road. We were on the road 20 days a month. So I see Marty Jannetty walk into the room. I walked into the room with him. He is tipping over the the uh the tank with all the rats in it and he let them loose in the entire arena and they were gathering and they were finding places to hide and go i think the company got a thousands and thousands of that dollar fine and marty Gennetti puts my name in with it and i brought that up to a hundred times he just laughs he just laughs so, so i had an actual list of um i had like a full list of like the tournament of pranksters. So um, I don't even know where I've written it here. So we had Fuji, Kurt Hennig. Uh, I didn't even put the. I didn't even put Marty Jannetty, Owen Hart, the Bulldogs, and uh, the Nasty Boys, which I thought was a bit of an outsider one. Yeah. Well, Nasty Boys were more of a uh, loud, obnoxious. Not obnoxious. They're good guys. I like knobs and says, but uh, very, very. Uh, like I remember, like, I was just with Lou Ferrigno in. Uh, I, I, it was an autograph thing in California, yeah. and uh, telling the story that he was trapped in the, he was trapped in an elevator with the Nasty Boys, and he was going crazy. They were riding death. They were riding him to death. As far as Davy Boy, his classic ribs was anytime he's seen a fire a fire stand like firecrackers, and uh, he'd buy smoke bombs. He would open the dressing room door, light a couple of smoke bombs, throw them in, and then latch the door with either a broom if it was a if, well, whatever the door was able to be latched with. And the whole place was full of smoke. And he, of course, he took off. But you want a classic of all ribs? Please. Okay, do you remember Paul Diamond when he did that? that uh, Orient Express, the... yeah. Yeah, okay. Paul Diamond wore a mask. Miss And uh, Iron Sheik had a 
you know, big Olympic winner, you know. I can't believe it, baby. This is the INC. He's catering out and at, at, at tapings is a is catering and they got like all these all these dishes and there's like 50, 60 people in there. So uh Marty Gennetti takes Cato's mask, goes behind Sheik, and schoolboys him. Now, wh whoever doesn't know what a schoolboy is, you clutch him from behind and fall backwards, and Sheik took the fall in front of 60 people, 50 people, and then uh, Gennetti ran away and threw, threw his mask back by Paul Diamond. So <laughs> sitting there not having a clue what happened. Sheik is furious. So who got the blame? Paul Diamond by Sheik. You <laughs> got a really did, did you ever hear the one, and I asked Dan Seven this, and he said he had no memory, that Owen did the exact same thing to him. Dan Seven was in the locker room, lying down, minding his own business, and Owen Hart had stolen one of the uh, luchadors from the Super Astro show and put it on, put the mask on, dove on top of him, yelled, two points, and then legged it out of there. I don't then... remember that. I don't remember it. I mean, it's, probably, it's most likely true, because Owen was a practical joker from a to, B, a to Z. I mean, he did everything. Great guy, great wrestler. I probably wrestled him 50 times as Owen and as Blue Blazer. And uh, I tell you, that's a great one we, that we lost. It really, really is. I'll tell you what then. I'm um, going to sort of end it on the ribs and we probably will come back to the ribs because I always love a good rib story. And I'll probably, I, I'm never going to write another book, but I still love all the prank stories. But one of the <laughs> things I noticed when I was looking at your be beginning of your career was uh, the name Dr. D, Dave Schultz, came up constantly as one of your <laughs> first ever opponents. Yeah, he was one of my first. I was still Steve Lombardi. I became Brooklyn Bowler in 1989. I wrestled it as my real name for five years or so. And he was, he was, he was tough. He was very tough. He would drop that elbow from the second rope. There's actually a match on YouTube with me and him. And uh, he was a he was a legitimate bounty hunter. Legitimate bounty hunter. So you got that in your notes? I'm interviewing him tomorrow. I've got four pages of notes uh -huh. on him. Tell him that I have the ultimate respect for him, please. <laughs> <laughs> Will do. I, I do. He's a good guy. I run into these guys all the time. Mm. You know, these autograph things. Do you um you you brought up before and you asked if I knew about it the John Stossel thing I, I will ask about the slap and everything first but I know do you, don't tell don't bring don't put my name in that no 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 I won't I won't put your name in it I won't put your name in it but do you do you remember the entire day when uh, 2020 it was ABC in 2020 were in yeah, the building John Stossel was out of out of out of line I'll be honest with you you don't go to a, up to a professional athlete and say this stuff is all fake you know what I mean the sentence David Schultz. Oh my God, did you see the scene where he just open handed him and knocked him down? You know, and I'm sure it was something, but he don't regret it. He'll tell you right to his face. He, he deserved it. He totally deserved it. Do you, uh, do you remember, and this is just one more bit about David Schultz, do you remember the last time he was in WWF? And I think it was for the uh, MTV Water Set of the Score. Were you there in the arena when uh, the whole Mr. T thing went down? Which Mr. T thing are we talking about now? Uh, Dr. D, I think he'd just been fired and he walked into the arena and got too near Mr. T and police dove on him, hogtied him and carried him out. Oh, because he was going to attack Mr. T? That was the theory they're running with. I don't know. I, 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 didn't, I didn't hear that. Oh, okay. I didn't hear that. I'll, um, I'll, I'll skip ahead on that one. And uh, I will ask you, uh, the whole rock and rock wrestling thing. So you were you were there before it, you were there during it. Oh, yeah, Cindy Lauper. Yeah. Cindy Lauper. Oh, yeah, Cindy Lapa loved Lou Albano. I met Joe Pitbull through Lou Albano. I met Danny DeVito through Lou Albano. Danny DeVito said to me that Lou Albano is the funniest person he's ever met in his life. That's what he told me. Coming from him, that means a lot. <laughs> but he, he was a character. He liked to drink. He had rubber bands in his, in his uh, cheeks. But a hell of a guy. I mean, I even posted a picture with me and him somewhere. I don't even remember, but I, I, I found a picture with me with me and him in a hallway somewhere. The uh, One of the questions I was going to ask you was uh, a uh, weird or funny specific Captain Lou Albano drinking story. Well, Lou Albano, I could tell you when, easily tell you when he wasn't drinking more than when he was drinking because he drank more than he didn't drink. But the, Andre was a big drinker. Andre was a big drinker. Andre, if he liked you, he would, he would treat you well. If he didn't like you, he would have to speak to you. He won't even talk to you. He liked me. He had me drive him around for quite some time, you know, maybe two months or a month. 
because Tim White took the job over. And uh, he says, boss, where you live? I said, I said, I'm right, right here from Brooklyn, Andre. Your, your parents still there? My, my father passed. My mother still lives there. And take me. That's what he said. So I called my mother up. And uh, I think it was Andre had this, those big white phones because there was no cell phones back then. I said, I listen, I'm bringing a wrestler by the house. He goes, who? I says, you won't know him. Just some guy that just started. So I pull up to the house. My mother, it's a second story house. My mother's looking out the top window. She sees me. I come out of the driver's seat. Then all of a sudden, the passenger seat opens and this big monster comes out. All I hear is my mother is, oh, my God. The whole neighborhood went, he was as big as Hulk Hogan in his prime back then. And he was the, the nicest guy. I went to his restaurant in Montreal and he, uh, I, I said, this is great, Andre. This is really going to be a success, boss. Money in the booze, not the food. He was just that kind of, and you know what he did for me one time? Yeah. I was in a battle royal and uh, he threw me in for a short foot. You know, like you just throw you in, put his foot up, but I take the ball. He dives on me. I said, holy shit, he's going to kill me. Every wrestler dove on top of him. But he, like, he kept his elbows protecting me. And he whispered in my ear, boss, I have you. And he took care of me. He took care of me. The other guys were trying to hurt me. You know, not hurt me, kill me. But it would have killed me. If they put all that legitimate weight on me, I would, I would never have been able to breathe. But Andre saved me there. He really did. Do you remember any of the time, any of the people who he wasn't so charitable and, and kind to in the ring? Oh, but if I say that, that's going to be bad blood. But uh, a lot of a lot of the young boys, you know, back then that were cocky. He didn't like loudmouths. Like he, didn't, I don't think he was crazy. I don't know. I don't really want to say it because you interviewed him. You're going to say, "Oh, I heard you didn't like this person." Andre didn't like you. You know, I, I, I put that in the negative, negatory state. Okay. Uh, well, I, I know a couple of names, like uh, I think Iron Sheik, he sat on and stuff like that. I, oh, I only know that name. He didn't like drugs. No. He didn't like And Sheik, oh, baby, I took A to Z and everything. <laughs> I took this. But meanwhile, Nikolai never did a drug in his life, never did anything. He needed a simple procedure called a stent, which he had no health insurance. That's what Sarge told me. So Slaughter told me that. And he said, I'll go cure it with herbs. He goes home, starts taking herbs. Two days later, he's dead. And this is a guy that never did anything. She's still kicking. You know, he's in a wheelchair, but he's, you know, he did. He abused his life more than she. He was the greatest roommate in the world, Nikolai. He had a hot plate. He, we, we'd go in the room, we'd share a room. He would cook me steaks. And he would, he would, just, he would love doing that. He just loved cooking. And you know, if you if you stick with Nikolai, you're going to save a lot of money, and you're going to get good meals too. Yeah, I know that he bought one suit and then stuck with it for the rest of his life, as far as I can tell. It looked it looks that way to me too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, going back onto Andre the Giant, and I love I love the the sort of fight stories, and you know when he puts some people in their place who come up to him in a bar and stuff like that. Were you ever with him yeah. uh, in any of those uh, instances? I was in. A, uh, do you remember Eddie Gilbert? I do. One day I wrestled Eddie Gilbert, and I screwed it up. He, he called a, a leapfrog. I, I went for the leapfrog, and he wanted to leapfrog me, so we looked like two imbeciles in the middle leapfrogging each other. So he comes back to the dressing room, and he starts, he starts yelling at me, cursing me out, and this and that, and this and that. Andre's just staying quiet. He didn't like Eddie. He liked me. And then uh, the following day, we go to another town. There's a knock on the dressing room door. All the boys are in there. There's a, 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 somebody with a birthday cake. I can't even remember who it was. Oh, it's Eddie Gilbert's birthday today. Can you please give this to him? Can I meet him? I'll go bring it to him. So me, knowing what happened two days ago, I walked up to him and said, they told me to give this to you, Eddie. I threw the cake in his face. <laughs> he got up to fight. Andre said, boss, sit. You deserve. <laughs> Holy shit. I, I was like, oh my God. Hey, you know, and it, right away, Andre saved, you know, he saved my, well, I, I could have, I could have held my own with him, but he, Andre, when he says that, you don't move. <laughs> you don't move. How was Five it? Uh, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, I was actually, actually going to say, uh, because I didn't realize this until quite recently, that he was actually an agent. Uh, I think maybe in like 84 or 85, he started becoming an agent. How was he as an agent? And, was it any? Oh, was it any different? I started in '83, I think, and I know he wasn't an agent then. I don't think that's a. I don't think that's reliable. That, that no. source. 
Very, uh, I think it was Michael Hayes at the time because he said it was Andre's first town where he was being an agent. If being an agent means, Andre, are you willing to do this or not? Hmm. That is that <laughs> Because you don't do anything Andre don't, don't want you to do. Even that big slam that he, when he slammed Hogan, he never told anyone if he was going to do it, if he lets Hogan slam him or not slam him. Hogan didn't even know. <laughs> Hogan didn't know. Oh, Hogan always contends that he didn't know he was going to win until he gets there. And Yeah, he, he didn't know. He told me that. He said, he said the, what happened was he got up there, but he says on the turn, when I had to turn his body over, is we heard his, he pulled his back muscle out. Hmm. Uh, I traveled with Hogan for like two years, two years, because he uh, he was so big at that time. He was on the front page of Sports Illustrated as the most recognizable sports entertainer. That he was he was big back then, and he couldn't go to airports and he couldn't go here. And nine eleven, no, that stuff never happened yet. So they weren't they weren't cracking down so much. So he asked Vince. He told Vince that he wanted me with him everywhere, which I was privileged. But he says to me, "I just want you to know." You're going to get a lot of heat. You're going to get a, have a lot of people mad at you. I, I use these terms, heat. Like people in your audience won't understand. No, no, no. I'll, I'll tell you, everyone's going to, it's, it's, it's specifically a wrestling channel. Everyone will understand, I assure you. Yeah. They said, you're going to get a lot of heat. I said to Hogan, why? He goes, because you're going to be sitting up first class with me. And, they, and, the, and the agent's going to be in the back. Huh. And uh, you, you see Chief J. Strong go past me. I'm in first class with Hogan. And he passes by me. Uh, Mr. Lombardi. You see, Chief, that's how we talk, Chief. He made like, Mr. Lombardi, uh, you're riding a little bit of a gravy train, aren't you? He's like that. And Hogan goes, I told you. <laughs> it, it, it happened. But Hogan was always good to me. He was always a good guy. I have nothing bad to say about Hogan. Nothing bad. No, I, I, I'd never asked for anything bad because I love Hogan. And to be honest, I always thought that he was a really, really good wrestler. A lot of other people say he wasn't, but I, th I thought he had tons of fire and I didn't say anyone sit down during his matches. So he must have been good. No, you, you know, I had this argument, not this discussion with a lot of people. They say, oh, well, Flair was a better a better wrestler than, than uh, Hulk Hogan. I said, I judge my wrestling by who drew more. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Not yeah. who did three more flips or who could do this and who could do that. Hogan could draw with a, with a broomstick. He could. He, he went in with Lanny Poffo and sold out hmm. as a genius. You know, I couldn't believe that. He was he was my first guest as well, Lanny Poffo, and he talked all about it. And he was he, he was yeah. you know, hugely yeah. grateful for him. Yeah, it was a huge opportunity. I'm sure he did it because of Randy, you know, because Randy was up there. And it's another guy I respected tremendously, Randy. Oh yeah, let me tell you something, brother. How are you doing? Yeah, I mean that's the dressing room talk. So that, that promo that you hear is not made up. I'm gonna go. Um, I'm gonna go straight from actually Randy, and I'm gonna leave Randy for now. I want to know all about Ultimate Warrior because before we came on, you said you had his first match, and I love everything about the Ultimate Warrior. But the first question I'm gonna ask you is: Don Morocco told me he was the worst driver in the entire world. Is that true? Morocco uh, was the worst driver. No, no, no. Ultimate Warrior was the worst driver. Oh, I don't know. I, he did me a favor. My car was broken down on the highway. He stopped at the limousine. He says, "You're with me." He picked up the, the limousine phone. He called, he says, call the, the rental car company. You're on mild marker, this and this, and tell them to pick it up and take you with me. So I'm driving the limousine with Ultimate Warrior. But this is my my good Ultimate Warrior story. Okay, you know, the company was down on Ultimate Warrior for a while. They made a, a video of the destruction of yeah. Ultimate War, knocking them and this and that. I, I, I produced the video, meaning I sat there and asked all the wrestlers the questions. Then I would put myself in the video and I would, I would say the question out loud, pause for three seconds, and then answer. So then they make men's. They put Warrior in the Hall of Fame. So I'm at the Hall of Fame. I'm looking for Warrior. I find Warrior's dressing room. He's got his own dressing room, private. I walk into the room. He starts crying. Well, not tears came down. He goes, I was just thinking about you. He goes, oh, oh, you better be pre prepared. He was stuttering like that. Prepared just to stand up tonight because I'm going to tell that story about how the agent said that you were going to beat me that one night to test my attitude. And you took me in the room and said that, that that's what that what was what it was all about. Because I told Warrior to just say anything you want, anything you want. And he says, that helped me so much. And you never said a negative word about me in that dumbass video. And I'm going to say, I said, 
please, warrior, don't do it because I'm still working on the company. And if you stand up and say, they told me something and I told you, and they told me that, you know, I'm going to look like they can't tell me nothing. And he started going, fuck, fuck, it was 30 fucking years ago. It was 30 years ago. I mean, that's exactly how he was. And he, and he goes, uh, well, I won't say that, but be prepared to stand up anyway. So <laughs> you have a look at the footage. I don't know if they showed it in the video, but he, he mm-hmm. says, was it even Marty Brooklyn Barola? He took a lot of my abuse and always kept a good head about it. That's all he said. Uh, speaking of the abuse, he was one of the uh, snug. I think the word would be uh, more snug of the wrestlers. Were you um, were you someone who was trying to because you wrestled him quite a lot, I believe. Were you someone who was trying to sort of rein him in, uh, you know, just do it in a safe way but keep the intensity and everything? How did you uh, mould him? He accidentally knocked me out twice. Blinking out. Accidentally, you know, but you know, I got him in a hammerlock and then he throws an elbow to, to the back, hits me in the temple. But his elbows were real elbows, you know, hard. But he never did it viciously or on purpose. I never was in a ring with somebody that tried to hurt me on purpose. Uh, do you remember when he came back in 96? Do you remember that brief run? And it just seemed to be fraught with sort of ten, you know, tension between him and the office all the way through. Do you remember that? You mean when he came back with the suit instead of the, with the muscles on the suit and all that? No, that was in 92. 96 was, um, I think, it was WrestleMania 12. It was the Shawn Michaels, Bret Hart, Iron Man match, WrestleMania. And it was for a few months around that time. Yeah, I, I remember. I was there for all of that, but I, you know, they all tied together, yeah. you know, because the Warriors so well by then. You know, he was a great guy. He brought Kerry Von Erich in, mm. you know, because Kerry Von Erich and him were friends, and then he came in, and oh God, you want a story? <laughs> oh my God! As soon as I said the word Kerry Von Erich, you know who he is? Yep, yep. I'm in the car, I and Sheik in the back, Kerry Von Erich in the passenger. Cadillac, sunroof, everything, rental car. He says, just drive steady. I'm on the highway, 60 miles an hour, whatever it is. And he gets out of the car, out of the, climbs out of the sunroof, hooks his foot onto the sunroof, puts his elbow on the hood and says, it's, he changed. don't slow down. This is relaxed. He had a prosthesis. <laughs> you know, one of them, well, I, I, I was freaked out. I was, I, 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 was, I was scared. Like, what's going to happen if I pass a cop? Are they going to yell at him or me? You know, I'm going to be, they're going to ruin my, my whole uh, police right <laughs> I was going to ask you which leg did he have in the, in the sunroof. I, I, I couldn't tell you that. It had to be a good one. Cause <laughs> the, bad, the bad one. Was, no, the bad, was one the bad one might have come off and left in the car and left him out. He was, he was a good guy. He was, he was always a good guy. He always, always missed his brother much. He always talked about his brothers. One day I'm going to dance with my brothers. That's what he would say. You know, but I don't want, you know, how about Warrior's last uh, interview before his death? Mm. Did you hear it? Yeah, yeah, I did, yeah. What stops beating? The Warrior will continue to live on. Then the day after, two days No, that would be the day after. That's mm. No, two days after, because SmackDown was after all. Two days after his death. Did he look unwell at the time? Because I remember seeing him on TV, and he did look like very red, but otherwise, no. No, he, he he was he was thin. When I when I hugged him, I, I was amazed at how small he was. I was bigger than he was, and he was. Uh, he seems like he was exhausted, exhausted from the years you know, mm. and all the the uh, battles with him and Vince and all that. His wife still works for the company, and he you know his legal name is War was Warriors. He changed it to that. Yeah. So it's like daughter is a uh, I don't know, I don't remember their names to be honest with you. Bondi Warrior. You know, like the last name is Warren. Yeah, it was, it was a smart legal move. But uh, I'll tell you what, I'll uh, move on from Ultimate Warrior and I'll ask you about probably the most loved manager of all time. We've got to go for Bobby the Brain Heenan because obviously he was the guy who gave you, he didn't give you your first break, but being associated with him gave you your first big character he, and your first real uh, he, shove. He came up with the filthy brawler. Are you going to be a kid from the streets that, that win street fights? And his whole spiff was with uh, Terry Taylor, who was the wrestler at the time, and they would have a battle. And I never forget, we're in Hershey Park, Pennsylvania, back in the back. Pile over there. He goes, roll around and get yourself filthy. And I said, What? I want you to be a grimy, filthy, dirty Brooklynite. And I, I was winning every night. I said, Are you sure? The money went up. He was great. Crazy, but great. 
How was he crazy? Because I don't really know any crazy uh, Bobby Heenan stories. He, he abuses he abuses life so much. He he just he liked to drink a lot. He wasn't a real big drug guy, but he was a drinker. He uh, it was unrelated to his death because he had cancer of the. They took his jaw around. Did you see his face? Yeah, got, yeah. It was really. I, I couldn't got, look at the photos. It was too depressing. I, I got the photos, and I got the, I got Warriors photo. Last photo I took before he, the day before he died, me and him, and he. Uh, Bobby was a he. You you could just go in a room with him and he come, come up with one liners to make you laugh like it's nothing. Like, like even when he was he couldn't speak anymore. He goes, he's going. Eah, eah, eah. His wife goes. He wants to show you his pride and joy. He hands me a picture with a pride laundry detergent and joy dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> so, he can't speak, can't do anything, but he's still joking around. <laughs> do you um? Do you have the same sort of affection for Gorilla Monsoon as well? Because I mean, that was that was just when I was starting watching wrestling, and I got a load. I started watching wrestling '93, and then I started getting tapes from '91, '92. And when I was a young, young boy, they were still the voices of my childhood. Yeah, Bob. Yeah, I have nothing bad to say about Gorilla. He was he was a good guy, but he was more business. He was more serious. Mm. You know, he, he was closer to Vince. I would say than a lot of people. Bobby was more like a free bird. He was on his he was on his own, you know what I mean? Doing doing what he wants and doing it with me. Hmm. It was did crazy. It, crazy life. I don't know. People never never understand unless you do it. Did you uh, uh was Bobby more of a ripper as well or not so much? He had bad rips. No. Oh. I, I, I I don't know if I should say it because it might put a bad light on the WWE. But he used to do things to the uh, the beverages that I didn't like with the ice in it, and you use your own imagination. Oh, <laughs> no, I don't. I'll, I'll leave it there. <laughs> uh, I'll tell you what, you know, one thing that you will know, right, and is is a bit of a source of fascination for me is obviously the new WWE Hall of Fame. We all know from 2004 till now. We know the format. We know how it goes. Is in the big arenas for the most part. But there was a Hall of Fame ceremony, and I think it was like around King of the Ring time for three years, 94, 95, 96. Can you tell me a bit more about what those uh, Hall of Fame ceremonies were like? Hall of Fames were like, and I wasn't crazy about them. I mean, I like the people in them, but you got to stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down, stand up, sit down. You know what I mean? It was like it was like a long, long night. But I don't know. Did they cancel Hall of Fame last year? Uh, they canceled it last year, and then they did both 2020 and 2021 this year. Oh, they did them both, but no audience. Was it no audience? Um, that's a great question. I didn't watch. I just know they did both they, together. They had, in, in Tampa for WrestleMania, I know that. Yeah. There was 20,000 people in a 100,000 people of the building. 25%. They stuck by, stuck by the rules. How's, the, how's, the, how's, the, how's all the problems in England? Are they bad with the COVID? Um, it's, it's, I think it's the lowest for about six, seven months now. I think more or less everyone's been offered who's over 40 the jab now. So I think we're, I don't know if it's just like us or Israel uh, mm. as, as sort of ahead, uh, you know, sort of leading that. But we were, I think it's like over like 120,000 deaths or something like that. So we were one of the worst hit countries. In a couple of weeks, we're opening up uh, pubs inside. There's been a month, right. there's been like a month where we um, could only go to restaurants and pubs, but only. Uh, drink and eat outside so which is a bit awkward obviously because it rains every single minute of every single day here and it's uh fahrenheit it's under 50 degrees now and we're in the midst of 20 straight days of rain so we're, now we're about we're about 50 right here in michigan <laughs> but, but it's been raining too yeah now, i think the whole thing but is the world going crazier is it me <sighs> i just i just well, want I, I to talk about i'm just saying I, I, mean, I, just, I just want it all over with just a few more months. I and then... do too. I want everybody to just get along. But you, if you, you don't, if you've been to New York at all ever, uh, I've been twice. Yeah. Don't go anymore. Don't go. The police will tell you to get off the street. Okay. They will tell you to get, they will, they, they, cause they took away search and seizure for the police. So the cop told me to get off the street. He says, cause I cannot do nothing for you. Even if I see a gun hanging out of someone's pocket, I can't search. He says, I can only help you if you get shot. And I don't want to do that. He says, I said, my grandfather used to take me here when I was a little kid. It's not like that no more. All the buildings were empty. There was even cars going around saying, get out of the restaurants, get out of the... I, I seen it on news. So my mom was in Brooklyn still and my brothers. So they, they, know, they know firsthand about how everything's working out there. Yeah, I, I went Manhattan, I think the last time was like 2014. 
maybe. And it was, I was going to ask you where the great places were to hang out there these days, but apparently nowhere. Well, I, I, all I know is my, my, my dream was to wrestle in Madison Square Garden because it's famous. But I one time I wanted to wrestle there. I wrestled there 52 times, 32 years. I wrestled in Wembley Arena. You know Wembley Arena? Of course, of course. I, I wrestled in Royal Albert Hall. I've wrestled all over England, all over the place. I wrestled in India. I wrestled in Australia. I wrestled in New Zealand. I wrestled. It was a hell of a journey. <laughs> it really was. And you're still wrestling now. I mean, your last no, was I, like last year, wasn't it? Re- nobody's wrestled. I had a wrestling school and I, I gave it up because this COVID thing. I don't want one of my students to get COVID and then say, Book and Ball of School got. But uh, no, I, I, I just do autograph signings now. Mm-hmm. I, I got four autograph signings coming up and uh i don't because if you're out of the ring for a year then you get back in it you're bound to get hurt yeah you know i think everybody feels that way yeah I, i'm gonna um i'm gonna move back on now and uh, i've got a segment that i call the fire and so i'm gonna fire some names at you and uh, i want you to tell me you know what you think of them uh and you know if you've got like a little story uh to go with it but um for everybody else i've been giving them wrestlers names and on-screen talent for the most part for you since you worked backstage for so long and i will actually talk about your agency career as well I've got a load of names that you work with who either were rarely on screen or never on screen, uh, but were big names sort of behind the scenes. So if you're ready, I'm going to throw some names out. And the first one is Steve Taylor. Steve Taylor, great guy. Happier when he went over. Unhappy when I went over. I'll give you, I'll give you little lines like that. How's okay. that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> Jimmy, agree with it. <laughs> uh, Jimmy Miranda. Jimmy Miranda. Steve Austin loved Jimmy Miranda. He was in charge of the uh, T-shirts and stuff like that, and uh, I had nothing about it. Nothing, on, nothing to say bad about Jimmy. Uh, Tom Buchanan, the photographer. He was a good guy. What did he do? He sky. I think he skydived, if I remember right. He was a photographer for WWE, but I think he. I think his hobby was sky. Something like that. It was something weird like that. Uh, Jim Troy. Jim Troy, Vince's friend. Yeah, wasn't he like the former ice hockey player? If it's the Jim Troy that I'm thinking about, Coco Beware beat the hell out of him in, in England. That is the Jim Troy I'm thinking about as well. One Coco Beware, he was he was really good friends with Vince at one time. I don't know if he still is, but Coco Beware did have a fight with him. <laughs> uh, Tony Chimmel. Tony Chimmel, good guy. I always call him Fred Flintstone. He's like your real life Fred Flintstone. In what sense? He's just a total caveman. The way he jokes around, the way he, uh, the, just the way he carries himself. He's a fun guy to be around. Hmm. Uh, Jim Dotson. Jim Dotson. He's been uh, gone forever. Yeah, he was the big security guy. Oh, Big Jim. He couldn't see? <sighs> was that the one? I don't know. I never I, saw him with glasses on. No, there was one, there was one Jim Dotson. I, I wonder if that was the one that was partially blind. They did security. He was like a, a muscular guy. Yeah, really big guy. Attitude era, like late Rock, 90s. Rock put him in one of his movies. Did he? I, I, I believe he, you know, no non speaking part. But I, yeah, very low key, nice guy. But he had a, he was, he was always he was down for. Yeah. Uh, Brian Gewertz. Brian Gerwitz. Rock loved him. Yeah. He was, he was, uh, he was always. Hanging around Rock and writing writing out Rock's lines, and you know they, he would approve everything, and he would come up with better stuff. He had he had a good handle on everything. He, he knew current events. He knew what to say, when to say it. Uh, Rich Herring. Rick Herring was a local was a promoter that would promote the big events. He, I think he's retired now. He's living in Sarasota, Florida. He was a bit eccentric. Yeah, he would work. He would work. You do know him? No, no, no. I, 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 you know, I don't know anything about. The, I know people about uh, stuff about most of these people I'm asking, but I don't know anything about Rich Herring. <laughs> yeah, well, he, he he wasn't in the company for many many years, but he was a little bit eccentric. Uh, were you going to say he was where he always wore a cape? Not always, but he did wear a cape. <laughs> Isn't that a Seinfeld episode where Larry Davidson he always wears a cape? Yeah, yeah, but he was doing it for he thought it looked good. <laughs> <laughs> He wasn't doing it for age. <laughs> uh, Basil DeVito. Basil DeVito. Oh, Basil, never, excuse me. Yeah, I never I never, uh, never had any experiences with him. Okay. Uh, Rene Goulet. Rene Goulet, I wrestled him many times. Did he die? 
Yeah, he died recently, and I think no one knew for about a year. Yeah, because I didn't know, and I was thinking about that the other day. Hmm. I wrestled him a lot of times. He he was in like in his probably fifties or sixties when I was in my late twenties, but I did wrestle him a few, more than ten times. Yeah. Uh, Mike McGurk. Mike McGurk was a ring announcer, and uh, she, I think she was the first ring announcer. So I would say she she made a mark as being the first ring announcer. And always a pleasant person. Hmm. Uh, Liz DeFabio. No association. She was. They, these people worked in the office. Ah, okay. Um, Howard Finkel behind the scenes because he apparently just Howard, did everything. Howard Finkel was a, Vince's first employee. Howard Finkel would always get mad when I said I was the longest per, uh, employee in the history. But no, but I, I was his first employee, and I said, Howard, I'm talking about wrestling. You never wrestled, so he. Didn't, he had, what, what, he, what he had? What he had? Very very sick. Yeah. What, what, what were his duties behind the scenes? Because was he just like a jack of all trades? Well, he'd do the announcing. And then I remember when we had the Monday Night Wars, he'd be watching both TVs and he would be writing notes of what's happening on WCW and what's happening on WWE. So Vince put a lot of things. He would always be the one to call me to say, we need you in this town. We need you to go to that day. He would always be like the, the guy to give the message to you. Uh, two more. Uh, Lisa Wolf. Lisa Wolf is another office person that was there briefly. I, I and uh, someone I've saved for last because I know you've got someone to say about him, Harvey Whippleman. Oh, good friend of mine. Very good friend of mine. Did you hear Rock just bought him a car? Uh, do you know, my, one of my questions was going to be, he's bought Haku a car because he lent him trunks for his first match. He's bought Harvey Whippleman a car, who I think drove him from Harvey, the airport. Because Harvey bought him a car when he was 16 and he was broke. And he says, you, I, you bought my first car and I'm buying your last car. I bought him a brand new F-150, which Harvey always hated big cars, but he took it. He yeah. says, he wouldn't let him drive it home. He flatbed it right to his house. <laughs> When's your car coming? Because you had a lot of, uh, <laughs> because you did uh, a lot for him in his first match as well. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying Rock would not be Rock without me. I just had his first match. I had his first match and he, he put me in his book and I, I don't need a car. I yeah. got plenty of cars. <laughs> well, but I, I can understand the sentimentalness about buying my first car when I'm 16. And it was a crackhead in the back. Hmm. It's funny. Harvey, Harvey said to him, it was on Entertainment Tonight, Mogul's program. Did it come in England? Did it show up in England? Uh, Entertainment Tonight. I, maybe on a cable channel. Not a big thing here. But first thing Rock said to him when he gave him the car, he, go, he, he, he had his mouth open. He goes, is there a crackhead in the back seat? <laughs> <laughs> there's, no, there's no crackhead in the back seat. <laughs> you've okay. got you've got to give us some more Harvey Whippleman stories because I mean you've I mean he oh, always oh. described himself as the uh, concierge. Oh. Yeah, he didn't like to be called. He didn't like to be called. He wasn't ever. He did everything. Vince Vince had him doing everything. We re returning cars, doing personal things for him, and uh, he's still he's still employed by the company. Mm. And he uh, he, he he is a concierge because. It's, Vince would say you could send you could send Bruno. His real name is Bruno Lauer. He likes downtown Bruno. He hates Harvey Whippleman. Hmm. He, he send Bruno out for a horse or bring you two horses. You know, like he's that good. Like he get the impossible done. Yeah, yeah, Bruno. I got all good things to say about him. Yeah, it's great. The first time I remember seeing him, he was managing Sid. But he, I'm sure yeah. he was wearing some weird black wig under his cap. Do you remember that? No, that, that was really his hat. That was really his hair. He's now his head shaved. He shaved everything off, but that was it. He never had a wig. All right. Well, that, I, that's an improvement then. He must have dyed it like jet black. Maybe he dyed it, but I traveled for 25 years. It was not a wig. Yeah. Have you got any like funny uh, downtown Bruno stories or, you know, anything like that you can share? He's, he's funny. Like what, the one time I was good for you, would, hit, would be, he'd say, hey, Vince, Bruno thinks if he calls his house collect, he won't be charged. <laughs> <laughs> oh, brother. And Bruno, Bruno would eat a hamburger. But he would never eat the last bite. I would say, "What the hell is wrong with you?" He goes, "Because if the last bite's bad, I don't want to ruin the other experience." I said, "That's retarded." That, to me, to me, that was a little bit odd. <laughs> Do you? Um, because yeah. we, oh, sorry, go ahead. <clears throat> we shared rooms for years and years. And three in a room, Snooker, Bruno, Bruno would just—he he would open up the closet, put a pillow and a blanket, and he—he he, he would just cuddle in the closet. It was a very easy roommate. Hmm. 
uh, was he always the one if you were going to split a room between more than the hotel would allow? Would he be the one in the uh, back of the car hidden away under the blanket? Yeah, yeah Bruno would always be the one to get the, the lesser of accommodations. <laughs> Are you also... Yeah, you also mentioned The Rock as well, and, you, and you've also mentioned like a list of other people you had their first matches with. Um, I've written a book about The Rock uh, last year, and I mention it whenever yeah. I can. And uh, I make the contention that uh, WWF were um, going all out to make The Rock look good, and, the, and their first port, port of call was pairing him with you, because you had no ego about making uh, you know, uh, prospects uh, you know, look good in the ring and be impressive. Yeah, because people people never realize. People are like, oh, the Brooklyn Brawler's getting beat. He's getting beat. He's getting beat. No, the Brooklyn Brawler is hiding their 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 uh, negatives and bringing out their positives. Rock's positive was his look. When I first seen him, I, I knew him since he's eight years old because I wrestled his dad's first match too. When I first seen him, I said, "Oh, another jock." That's what I said to myself because he was he looked like a football player. And he went. And then he, he came in a room with me. I wrote down all these spots and stuff. He wrote on a napkin. He acted like he, he's got it all. He's got it all. Then I read his book. He goes, oh, what Steve Abadi wrote gave me those moves. I was so nervous. I put, I put it down on the napkin. I didn't even tell him. He hit everything on the money. He hit everything on the money. Got a contract the next day. Yeah. So, actually, I was going to ask you about more about the match as well because there, there's no footage that's ever been released of your match with him, but there is of the second match with Chris Candido. So, I mean, how did it go and uh, who won? It oh, mine was dark. Mine was yeah. dark. I don't uh, Chris Candido's was dark as well. They released it as like the raw footage. Who posted Candido's match? Uh, WWE themselves. Uh, the they posted the raw footage uh, onto their YouTube channel a few years ago. I was so that, wondering... must, that must not have been dark after because that was the day after me, mm. which would have been a SmackDown. And but he, they should probably said, "Oh, this guy's got potentials." Yeah. No, th- no, this was this was years before SmackDown. This was nineteen ninety six. Well, I don't know. I, I, I can't even answer that question because yeah. I never. I never seen my first match with him, but I, all I can tell you was it was good. He right. just wrote, he just put on his uh, on his social media. He's put, uh, I was never in front of an audience on, on his Instagram. He goes, I was never in front of an audience. He says eighteen thousand people strong, Corpus Christi, Texas, nineteen ninety six. He goes, I've never stepped in a ring. He goes, and all I heard when I walked out was Rocky sucks, Rocky sucks. He goes, he goes, but you know what? person that was in the ring with me was the legendary Brooklyn Brawler who was gracious gracious enough to, to let me win, which I wasn't. They, they tell you what to do. Mm-hmm. And they, that's why I wanted to lose on my way out. You got to get back to the company. You got to get back to what was given to you. That's what he said. So, I mean, I thought that was nice. Uh, were you, uh, I'm assuming your uh, opinion was uh, highly valued from Vince as far as, uh, I mean, how would you how would you go about evaluating somebody? Would you just give them like one sentence or would you give like a full rundown of uh, uh, people that, you, you test out? It's a good example, John Cena. No, they were giving, giving him a second look. He had a mohawk. He called himself the prototype and he was sitting around in LA. So I was controlling the, they call it a pre tape room, which is interview room, which does whole videos, all these different videos that you see. So I brought Rock in there. I mean, I brought uh, Cena in there. I said, cut a promo. And he cut a promo so well. But then he, what he did was he reversed the promo. Like, like he reversed his word. I went, holy shit. So I said, just stay here. I knocked on Vince's door. I said, Vince, we got a ringer. We got a ringer. He goes, really? I said, I'm telling you, this guy can talk his ass off. He goes, tell the writers to put him in a match with Kurt Angle. That's what he said. And and they did it. And I don't know if you've seen that match. Yep. That yep. was that was seen his first match. And he did very well. Seen is seen is like remarkable at, at boy told stuff like that. And he talks Chinese fluently. Yeah, this was because um WWE were trying to get into the Chinese market and no one even asked him to. They just said, Oh, yeah. I'll just I'll just try and learn. Yeah. He did it on his own. He opened he opened a Chinese Twitter account. I mean, and it's hard. I mean, it, it sounds like a hard language to me. Yeah, I think it's meant to be, apart from, I think like English is meant to be the second hardest language or something to learn, then Chinese is the hardest, or because it's just so right. alien. But I, I tell you what, I'm actually going to go back, straight back to you. And yeah. when did you start becoming almost like a player coach, like half agent, half agenting and then half staying on the road? And uh, what? And in fact, actually, take me, take me to uh, being an agent full-time and... Um, what, what, what were your full I, I duties? Myself an agent. 
call myself a producer. Well, what, what it was is I was I wrestled full time, twenty one days a month, seventeen years. Seventeen years I wrestled everybody and anybody, and then, and then after I stopped wrestling full time, I, I I got in charge of the uh, pre tape room, which is the interview room, and then oh, we were having celebrity GMs come in, celebrity GMs. And uh, I would interview every GM. And I'm talking guys like Kevin Hart, Hugh Jackman. You know who Hugh Jackman is? Yep. Well, okay. Right. Hugh, Hugh Jackman's in a building. He walks up to me. He goes, you're the only one I recognize in this building. He goes, I don't even know who Santa is. He calls Cena Santa. He goes, I don't even know who Santa is. I says, why, why, why would that be? He goes, it was in 1984. He goes, I wasn't even an actor. I watched you wrestle live in Sydney, Australia with my dad. Can I please take a picture of you? And tweet it out. I said, ain't I supposed to ask you this? He goes, no, I'm serious. And he did it. And then when he came back the second time, he did it again. <laughs> I mean, unbelievable. For a guy like, you know, the nicest guy, no ego. I mean, no ego whatsoever. Kevin Hart, so down to earth, you would not believe it. Jenny McCarthy, nice person. Uh, but there's so many stars that came through. You have no idea. Uh, I've got to ask this. I know you don't want like any negativity, but you've got to give me the worst celebrity on the uh, thingy. And why was it Al Sharpton? Why wasn't it? Or no, why, why was it? it? You know the story? Of course I know the story, but I'm, no one wants to hear me. No one wants to hear me. You're talking about the one about Jerry Lawler? Oh, no. Al, uh, Al Sharpton, the, uh, the preacher. He was raw GM, wasn't he, in the late 2000s, I think. That's a black, the black guy who's yeah. always... Morning. I well, my story was I had him endorse Jerry Lawler as mayor of Memphis, <laughs> not knowing. You see, I, I, with all this stuff going on, I really want to bring that subject up. You know what I mean? But I'm just saying, he didn't even realize who he, he who Lawler was running against. I, d I don't know that story at all. Do you want me to move on from that? I. Yeah. I'll move on. Oh, all right. I have no idea what it is, but I'll move on. So, um, tell me, um, so not agent producer then. So, what is all of a producer's um, powers Dude. and responsibilities throughout, uh, let's say, a working week? Okay. I, I would be at every TV and pay per view, which is three times a week once and two, two times every other. So, three times a week, I'd be there two days. So three weeks a month, I would be there two days, and one week a month, I'd be there for three days. And I would get lists of things to do. There would be international interviews. I would have to get certain wrestlers. Some guys were good. Some of the guys, these are, these are emails that are sent to me from, from Titan Towers. And uh, they would say, get me three wrestlers. And I could I know the three easy guys. I know who's easy to get and who you can't get. And then there was other hard ones. Like, I remember we did a Royal Rumble, uh, cold open, a cold open. A cold open. I know you don't know what a cold open no, is. I know exactly what a cold open is. No introduction, just straight in there. No, cold open is a story synopsis about what the pay-per-view is about. Okay. Okay, so anyway, they wanted every wrestler in the company, including Undertaker, Stone Cold, everybody, in a triangular position with with a, a blue screen behind it, a chroma key ski. You know how hard that was? I shot the whole thing. I had to, I had to get everybody in the room at one time. My audio guy screwed up. There was no audio. I had to get him in twice. I had to get him in twice. You Notice know, like going up to Stone Cold and Undertaker, brother, we got to do it again. Believe it or not, they were the easiest. They were the easiest. It's the, it's the other people, and I'm not going to say their names, that are like, uh, I don't want to do it. I'm not doing it. And then, okay, so I'm just going to put down this paper. You refused. If you want to hear a great, a, a great interview. Did, did you listen to the podcast with me and Jericho? I did. When was it? Was it a few years ago now? Or was it? Years. He flew to my house. We did it in my basement. And he did so many hits on that damn thing. That guy, that guy is like a chameleon. He could become, he could change his character like in one day. He wants, he, he, he asked me one question. He goes, let me ask you a question. Why did you ask me to remove my watch? I says, and you said no. I go, yeah. And, I, and then you, and you turned to me and said, well, I have to say to, to the office that you refuse to do your interview because you wouldn't re refuse to re uh, remove your watch. He goes, believe it or not, that changed me. He says, because I realized you were thinking about me, not you. You know, and he was really nice about it. You know, I forgot the whole story. But uh, 
were you um were you in charge? And I've got to ask this: Were you in charge of uh, or one of the people who would institute fines for lateness? Not in charge. That would, that would be my boss, mm. John Lauren. Who, who was my boss? Who was Animal's brother? Yeah. You know, and I believe it or not, I traveled with Animal a year before he died. He almost killed me in the car because he was texting when he was driving. <laughs> and he pulled the bike. Stephen Barty just saved my life, saved all life. He said, "Little did you know, he should be dead next year." Uh, All right, and I promised I'd ask this, uh, and you yeah. said you'd had loads of great stories. Jim Who Cornette. told you? That? You he told, told me. me. You told me, Jim Cornette. You said you had loads of great he, stories of Jim Cornette. Jim Cornette is going to give you give you all the stories with a twang in it. Yeah, and it's going to be a lot of negative. Oh, I don't know. I don't want to. I don't want to burn a bridge with Jim. He's a good guy. Oh, oh I always, God. I always got along with him. I always got along. <laughs> Everyone burns a bridge with Jim, though. That's the funny thing. I tell you one thing. He's one guy who's going to talk faster than you. You talk. Um, I, I should slow down, then, shouldn't I? I was a, so uh, yeah, go ahead. No, no, no. I was just going to say he's he talks fast. Yeah, but you get to taste your own medicine. Um, the uh, generally, I mean, I tried doing it, but no one could ever think of a question for anybody else. Was uh, I'd ask the person I'd just interviewed uh, to ask a question for the next person, and I think I've done that twice because no one could right. ever think of a, a question for anybody else. I wouldn't know what you could ask Jim Cornette. Tell tell them that Brooklyn Brawler said mm. you were one of, you're one of the greatest speakers or one of the greatest managers ever. And no, I don't say that. I step on Bobby. You know what I'm saying? It's oh, no, I, I'm not speaking. I'm not interviewing Jim. I'm not interviewing him at all. He's oh, not, oh, I thought he was after Dave. No, no, no. That's Don Morocco again. You going to do Morocco over again? Yeah, we're hoping to start a podcast. Um, you him and together? I. Yeah. So oh, I'll. Um, I'm doing. A- I said. A- Tell him I said hello, and I always speak highly of him. Please tell him that. Yeah, I will. Do. I'll, tell, I'll even write it down at the end of this. I'll write down uh, that as well because we do- always, always talks highly. Of you. you know, he had he had shoulders like bowling balls. Yeah, I mean, this guy was he, he was big. He was big. When did he first wrestle, Dom? I wrestled him on TV a few times. It was just squash jobs, two minute matches, three minute matches. But you could just feel his brutal strength. I remember he had me in a head scissor. And I was, holy shit, he could literally kill me with that, with his legs, if he wanted to. Hmm. You know, he's that, he was that thick and that powerful. Yeah, but, fantastic promos as well. Really, yeah, good promos. Morocco, A1 talent, A1 talent. Do you remember when, um, here's a question that I'd written down and was going to ask earlier, uh, was, do you know the time when it just became apparent that Vince McMahon and the WWF were just going to be taking over wrestling? I think it was. Uh, I think. I think the Monday Night Wars was scary for a while because it would beat WWE in the ratings. It would beat them in the ratings. I think Stone Cold kind of turned that around a lot because they had Goldberg. We had we had Stone Cold, and Stone Cold was just captivating because Vince was able to work. We, you know, he did all the, let Stone Cold do all that stuff to him. You know what I mean? Now, who doesn't want to beat up the boss? You know, you know what I'm saying? He, he's actually everybody's living vicariously through Steve Austin with the things he's doing. And he's done some crazy stuff. You should see the thing I did with him where he comes up to me. Remember when somebody hit him with a car or something like that? And then he said he's seen me pass by in the car and he comes he talks, t- talking to me and there's a big coffee coffee uh, table behind me and uh, he's looking at me and he goes, uh, you sure you don't know nothing? And then he just flinches at me and I flip backwards over the coffee table and, and, and he go, and, and what the closing line was, you better quit the caffeine. <laughs> We got to do it again. We, you, I do it three times. You always like to do that three times and trust that you're going to roll your back over a complete table and land properly without getting hurt. It's crazy. As um, somebody who uh, worked with Vince McMahon or for Vince McMahon for 32 years, did you ever pick up on any of his strange habits or like peccadillos? Who's that? Uh, Vince McMahon. Who? Pick up on his strange word peccadillos. I don't yeah, want to... uh, uh, odd habits like uh, no one was allowed to sneeze around him. No one was allowed to smoke in the entire office building. He hated cigarettes. He was a very clean eater. He he ate very clean, but he ate a lot. And he trained in the middle of late at night or early, early in the morning. The guy was in the greatest shape I've ever seen a man of his age. He's 75 now. Does he? Uh, is he still hitting the gym still? I don't know. I'm not there no more. I'm not there, but they're still on good terms. I get residuals for life. 
did you make more as a wrestler or did you make more as a producer? I probably did better as a producer because they implemented contracts. And if you wrestled on a Hogan card, you get more money than if you wrestled on a somebody low, like uh, Bret Hart. Or I'm not, I'm not knocking Bret because a lot. But what I'm saying is Hogan. If you're under the A, we were running three towns a night. You're either on the A, B, or C. If you're on the A, you're going to make a lot more money. If you're on B, you're going to make less money. If you're on C, they throw together a main event, Rick Rude against uh, somebody else. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just like the luck, the luck of the draw. We um. When you were uh, hanging around Hogan for a couple of years, did you find yourself on the A shows more? Yes, all A shows, because I had to be with him. Mm. So I'm always no. He he would wrestle the main event, and I would always wrestle the opening match. Uh, I'm going to ask you a couple more. Are we all right, like for a couple more questions, then we'll. Uh... Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'll give you, I'll give you a couple more because. My wife wants to go to a restaurant and go eat. All right, fair enough then. Okay, I'll be only a few more minutes. I'll ask you a couple more things. You've got to, you've got to uh, give me uh, what was a knuckleball Schwartz, the uh, baseball thing. Uh, could you explain that one to me? Okay, knuckleball Schwartz. You remember the movie The Warriors? I've never seen it. Okay, it's it's a movie about these uh, these gangs, and some and one of them was a baseball game where they had that face on, and they walked around with bats, and, and they were a street gang that fought other gangs. So. Back then, the, the movie was kind of popular. Do you remember Damien Demento? Yes. He was a very good artist. I gave him a napkin. I said, draw me a face and make the face be a baseball. He drew it beautiful. I walk into Vince's office. I knock on him. I, I put it in front of him. His glasses tilt to the tip of his nose. And he goes, oh. I said, it's never. No, he goes, I'll give it some thought. To me, that's a no. <laughs> I said, it's never been done before. He goes, really? That that caught his that caught him more than anything that he's going to do something that no one has ever, never, ever did before. Uh, was it only going to be for a few months because the baseball season had been cancelled? Well, no. What happened was the baseball season wasn't cancelled. They weren't on strike yet. So we did. We were doing. We were doing goofy vignettes, like where I would be on a baseball field with a whole team, and I would I would blast the ball out there, and it would be like like I'm a big shot, and they would pan out, and it would be a little league baseball team. <laughs> it was stuff like that. Then all of a sudden, right in the middle of building this thing, the strike hit. Vince is like seeing, oh my god, send him out with a strike sign, you know. So I'm walking through the audience, I'm on strike, and that's where they started saying. Well, he's on strike. This baseball player is on strike, and then all of a sudden, the baseball player is going to start wrestling. He's, I start wrestling, you know, and they, they they let me win for a while. Then one day, Vince says, "There's too much paint in the territory. There's you, there's Doink, there's Gold Dust, and me, his jokey young kid." I said, "Get rid of Doink." <laughs> well, Vince, I'm, he, I go, I just, I thought you, were, I said, I, I thought you were going to nurture it. He goes, "Nurture," like like that, like that was an odd thing to say. You know, but they, they, they lasted about six, seven months. And uh, just because you mentioned Doink as well, which Doink were you in the l long the list third, of Doinks? I was the third Doink. This is how Doink came about. I get a, I'm, I'm off. Uh, I get a call at, at my house. It's Vince. I'm washing my car in the driveway. My wife gets the call. She calls me. Vince is on the phone. Vince, holy shit. This is, this is the exact call. Steve, Vince. Yeah, Vince, how, how, what do you need? Oh, I know I could ask you anything. He goes, I need you to rest, Bre wrestle Bret Hart in Calgary as the main event. I said, no problem. I wrestled Bret many times. It's easy. He goes, the only difference is it's as doink. I went, Vince, the paint job. I've never done it. I've never had a paint on my face in my life. He goes, ha, 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 ha. I knew you were going to say that. He goes, we're going to fly you from your house to Stanford, Connecticut. Jill, the makeup girl, is going to teach you the paint job, give you all the paint. No, no. First, we're going to fly you to Cleveland to get the suit for Matt Bourne's wife. Then we're going to fly you to Stanford. I missed that part. And then you're going to teach me to do the paint job. Then you're going to jump on a plane and go all the way to Calgary. Then you're going to and try, try doing a paint job in front of Kurt Henning. And, and it's the first time. And you know, I'm in the main event and Kurt's below me. And so so, so what, he's, he's pushing my arm. He's trying to screw me up. So I finally get the, book, the, the job done. And Doink was the, the hottest heel at that time. 
So when I walked through the through the curtain, the reaction I got was insane. And I go from Brooklyn Ball to I mean it was insane. And I just go into with Brett, and Brett's easy to mess with. He's very easy. Did uh, did anybody in the audience go? It's 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 Brooklyn Brawler, no. it's Brooklyn Brawler. No. No. They never knew I was doing or came she till later in life when I stopped doing it all. And I exposed it all. I mean, I was Doink the Clown, Brooklyn Brawler, Kim Chi, MVP. Well, I wanted MVP. He says, we can't use MVP. We'll be sued by the Baseball Association. And then they bring in MVP. MVP. <laughs> Call me Mem- Melvin Vern Peterson. How's that? You know what I mean? Like, he, you know, it's, it's crazy. One one time I, I was in the gym and I met these guys from the American Choppers. I don't know if you guys got that show out there. I've heard of it. Choppers. So those guys meet me and they, they recognize me. They say, would you pass the message to Vince McMahon that we will build a motorcycle and give it to him if he lets us do an episode on him in our, in our show? So now I said, like, holy shit, I got, I'm going to hit a home run. I'm going to go to Vince, and I'm going to tell Vince this. He's going to go, oh, my God, look what he just got the, a deal for us. I walk into Vince's office. I tell him the whole deal. The first thing he says is, don't you realize that the same time slot as us, and we would be giving them the rub, they would not be giving us a rub? I said, no, I wasn't aware of that. So you have a question. He's going to the statement he's going to say to you. That's your first. Like you got to pre. You, you can't. You can't. Ex, you never know what to expect from. Him. You know, he'll always come out with more knowledge, more, more, um, more knowledge than you have. I should say. Um, before I forget, how come you weren't doing longer? I can't remember who it went to in the end. Well, off doing, and then when Matt Matt Bourne died, the dot com puts out Doink the clown dies instead of. Matt Bourne, who played Doink the Clown, passes. They put Doink the Clown pass on, on WWE.com. I, cr- I told those guys, you're the dumbest son of a bitches i ever seen in my life to do that. You, 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 you buried the gimmick. You didn't bury the man. You know what I mean? So that, that, that's, that's my thoughts of that. That's why they killed me. No, I was, I was actually asking uh, when you were doing it in 93, how come you didn't do it for longer? Well, they were fading it out. They were fading it out. You know, no more Matt. They had Steve Kern for a while. They had me. And, you know, everything everything died for a while. And then uh, Tiger Jackson had to go as well, I suppose, at that point. Oh, the little of the dink? Yeah, dink, yeah. Dink, yeah. Yeah, they, they got rid of him too. <laughs> he, oh, he, he was terrible. He was terrible, that guy. <laughs> Odd things. But you he's, can he's, he's being funny. And he's, he's sitting in the car and he goes, you goof. I say, shut the, shut the hell up. And then Rick Martel's in the car too, and he's sticking up for the, for the clown because they're both French Canadians. You know what I mean? And uh, but what a wise guy, little little wise guy. <laughs> well, do you know what I think? I think to end on Dink the Clown there, and I will let you get because you're going to a restaurant now, aren't you? Yeah, we're gonna go eat. 